Hello everyone, this is Elisa Baum, Percona's Director of Product Marketing. We'll begin in just a moment, but first let's just do a little bit of house cleaning. Could you please raise your hand in the GoToWebinar control panel to let me know that you can hear me? Let's see, do we see any hands? Oh, I see some hands. Thank you, that's very helpful. Next, during this webinar, you will be on mute. Should you have any questions during the discussion, enter them in the questions field within the control panel. I've been told that this is a very meaty presentation, so please ask your questions throughout, and if we don't get to your question today, Justin will definitely do a blog post with all your questions, answers to your questions um, as soon as he can get to that. So again, I encourage you to ask as many questions as possible. Um, in addition, I will make sure that everybody here gets a recording of the webinar as well as the slides within 48 hours. So with that said, thank you for attending today's webinar called Introduction to Open Source column stores. It is presented by Justin Swanhart and he is Percona's principal support engineer and trainer. And with that said, I'd like to turn the floor over to Justin. Go ahead, Justin. Good morning or uh, good afternoon if you are on the East Coast or, well, good wherever you are, I guess. So uh, my name, as she said, is Justin. I'm going to just talk about column stores today. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk quickly about what is a row. Uh, I know that everybody says I know what a row is, but I want to take a step back and look at it from the, you know, a, a basic point of view. Then how a row store works, which is typically what you've been using if you've been using MySQL. And then finally, uh, what is actually a column store? You've probably heard the term. And then uh, we'll talk about particulars of column stores and, and what they bring to the table. Uh, a little bit of compare and contrast with the row store there, and then talk about available column stores that are actually out there so that you know uh, what to go look at uh, when you want to investigate this further. And uh, in the uh, follow-up blog post that I make uh, to this uh, with answers to questions, and hopefully there will be questions, I will uh, include a list of links to all of these different uh, column stores. <coughs> And then finally, I'm going to have a little performance comparison uh, between uh, the uh, single node databases and then the multi node databases. So, what is a row? Right? The database is structured data. We're talking about tables that contain rows. So, CMS tables and rows. The rows consist of columns. Right? So, the rows are an atomic piece of data. They're one entity that is all associated to this table. So it's an entity inside of a table that's an, that's an atomic piece of data. The row, the columns are all associated with each other. I should say the column values are all associated with each other. And that's going to be through whatever, you know, the PK, if it's order ID, all of the values belong to that one order ID. Uh, if you don't have a primary key in NNDB, it creates a hidden primary key called the gen class index. Uh, in my SM, uh, it's just a row offset you know, into the table. The primary key points to a physical offset in the MYD file. And in some databases, it's just a virtual identifier. It doesn't have any real uh, meaning. It's just a way to find all the contents of a row. Primary key, I mentioned, right? The primary key is a column or columns that uniquely identify a row. And if there is no primary key, there has to still be some sort of hidden field or piece of data that uniquely identifies the entity as a row. All right, so we have a table full of rows. Here it's a table full of mad scientists and uh, what they were killed by in various movies. So here we see that Reinhardt was killed by his crew, technically by an action of his crew uh, in Disney's The Black Hole. Right, so that first row is all identified by primary key one. If I want to delete, delete this row, I could delete row one 
and then would be gone. If I didn't have a primary key, in InitDB, I would get a hidden field that is equivalent to a row ID. Right? So there's this hidden field out there that points to that row. <clears throat> so this is materialism, as I would call it. Right? All of the columns are together for a single row on disk, the exception being off-page storage for blobs and clubs, especially in ODB. But um, the column values are all going to be together in the same place in disk in general. So the row is already created in storage. Right? The row is already there. You don't need to construct the row from the individual columns. So my SQL basically the engines are all row stores uh, for the most part. All the engines that you've commonly used. That's because the storage engine is row oriented. And in general, the storage API stores and retrieves entire rows from disk. So a row store is a database that stores entire rows together and retrieves entire rows together from disk. Right? And the predominant storage format in modern databases is row formatted storage. The traditional Oracle, uh, MS SQL, they all use uh, row store. You know, PostgreSQL, Firebird, SQLite, everything pretty much is a row store. <clears throat> As I said, this is basically how a row store looks on disk, right? All the row is stored together uh, along with some row ID, in this case the primary key, right? And it would be all of the columns are stored in the leaf node of the primary key. So uh, all of the columns are right there when we want to get the data. And oftentimes deleted rows can take up some space, right? Some storage engines can fill in that space later. Uh, others, they have to be uh, rebuilt periodically to reclaim that unused space. So this works really well when all or most of the columns are needed uh, each time you fetch a row. So if you're uh, working in the order entry system, right, typically you're going to modify all of the attributes about a particular order header or a particular order line when you're working on it. Right? This screen is going to display everything about it. So it very much makes sense to use a row store in that case. Anytime small amounts of data is inserted or updated uh, and these operations are frequent, then a row store makes a uh, lot of sense. <clears throat> Just keep in mind that the cost of reading and writing data grows as the size of the row grows. That is, the average row size increases the cost of operations. So row stores are great for OLTP, so online transaction processing. In OLTP workload, every query reads a tiny portion of the table, typically a single order or you know, a single line. And the data set is typically you know, small. Typically, uh, the OLTP system is regularly pruned, and uh, historical data may be sent to a reporting system, which is OLAP which we'll talk about in a moment. So the working set typically fits in RAM. And MySQL's nested loop joins work well as well because small amounts of data are being examined. But not great if you've got wide rows. Right? If your uh, average row width is you know, 1K, then you're going to be reading and writing 
a lot of data to get a single 8-byte column uh, out of a table. So any workload that reads only a small subset of the columns for most of the queries is going to really uh, have a penalty on a row store. Also, any workload that has to scan tables that are larger than RAM, right? even when the result set is small. So uh, the, especially if uh, index can't be used efficiently and the table has to be scanned, then a uh, column store doing all this extra I.O. to read the entire table only for a small portion of it is going to waste a lot of I.O. So OLAP is basically what we've been talking about, reading large portions of the table, but a small number of columns. And loading and uh, of data in batches. Right? So uh, rather than doing uh, transactional uh, updates of small amounts of data, you know, loading an entire hour or a day's worth of data at a time. And bigger amounts of data, data that doesn't necessarily fit uh, into RAM. Right? So uh, using good compression, uh, the query can reduce I.O. significantly. So machine-generated data is uh, definitely very well suited for uh, this type of system. For example, with a row store, right, we're going to select some of some metric from a table. Let's say there's a million rows in the table and the table has an average row length of 1,000 bytes. That one column called metric is a big int, so it's 64 bits, 8 bytes. However, the entire row has to be read to get that one column, so there's no covering index. So one gig of data, right, a million rows times 1,000 bytes, has to be read to get that 8 megabytes of column data because we're only accessing a single column from the table. So one gigabyte of I.O. for eight megabytes of data. And this is just an example of that. We have a row. The storage engine gets the whole row from the table. It extracts out only the column called metric and then it continues to scan until it's complete and then returns the result. So it can waste a lot of I.O. by reading all of those extra columns. Now, one of the common methods to make a query like this faster would be to co create a covering index on the metric column. In that case, only the covering index would be scanned, reducing I.O. This is why I often say that using covering indexes approximates the performance of a column store on a row store because it essentially places that single column into its own little separate data area that can be scanned independently, just like a column store can scan each column independently, which is the major benefit of a column store. Because in a column store, the rows are not materialized during storage. The rows are not, or the columns rather, are not stored together on disk. Right? A single row is not all next to each other on disk. All of the column values for a single column are stored together. Right? So there's one file or one segment per column rather than one file or segment per table. So a row has to be reconstructed in memory. It's ephemeral, does not exist anywhere except in memory. But there is still some sort of row ID that ties all of the columns together to form a row. In the simplest of column stores, each of the, uh, the columns is simply a fixed with array, right? And the row ID is just a uh, offset into uh, that array. So here is a simple 
column store. Each of the columns, ID, title, person, genre, is essentially an array. Right? And if we want column one, row ID one, then, or sorry, yeah, row one, we can just go for the first row. So if we select star from table where ID equals one, the column store can find ID one, say, oh, that's row ID one, I need all the other columns for row ID one, and go get them. One of the big benefits of storing the column data in individual uh, files or segments rather than uh, together in a row is that the data can be compressed much better. Right? In a row store, typically entire pages have to be compressed. It needed to be 16 KB pages are compressed to 8 or, K, uh, eight or, or 4 or 2 KB. In uh, TokuDB, uh, it has 128 KB uh, pages, is I think, uh, and so uh, it compresses those 128 KB pages down using uh, some sort of common compression, and maybe LZMA or or whatever. Column stores use data type tailored compression. Right? So for strings, if you have a string with low cardinality it can replace that with a small lookup table, right? a dictionary lookup, it's similar to an automatic enum, if you will. Right? It can do integer packing and frame of reference compression, for example. Uh, RLE, run length encoding, right? and there's other forms, and uh, most of these allow the data to be operated on sometimes while remaining compressed. So the storage cost is overall reduced by this compression, sometimes significantly. Right? Column column stores tend to claim 10 to 1 to 31, 30 to 1 compression ratios. I typically see somewhere between 5 to 1 and 15 to 1. Uh, it really depends. Uh, for uh, completely evenly distributed data, 5 to 1 tends to be fairly common. Now, so queries may execute a lot faster compared to a row store because the amount of I.O. is reduced significantly. And we'll talk about that right now. So this is that same example. Select some metric from fact. Same million rows. Uh, average row length, basically the same. The average row length doesn't matter, though, because only that single big int column has to be read from disk, because that column is stored separately from all of the other columns. So that single column is read so only eight megabytes of data may have to be read from disk, and it could be even less. Right? If that column compressed well, it might be you know, one megabyte or less of data. So uh, that column, that, that query could be significantly faster because it might need to read a megabyte of data versus a gigabyte of data. So orders of magnitude performance differences can typically be seen between row stores and column stores, especially when data doesn't fit in memory. So there are some downsides. Accessing many or all of the columns in the table is expensive. It may actually even be more expensive than the row store. So it's generally not ideal for tables with few columns. Uh, typically, uh, column stores are used in a data warehousing type environment, typically for either very wide tables that uh, are have very, very many attributes, sometimes thousands, uh, or uh, sometimes somewhat smaller tables with hundreds of columns and additional lookup tables, like a star schema. So 
select star from a long wide table for one particular row might not be uh, very good for the column store. And um, this is one of the t things that I'm going to look at. I'm going to look at in the uh, performance comparison. So we'll see. But just keep in mind, this would have to go open each of those individual uh, columns in some cases and scan them all and only return the one row that uh, matches that order line ID in some cases. So that would be quite expensive. Updates on the column store are expensive. For this reason, some column stores are even append only. And that's not as bad as it actually sounds. In a lot of cases, we're dealing with things like uh, sensor data from machines, right? And in those cases, uh, the data is not going to be updated, right? We get a sensor, piece of sensor information once, and we write it, and we never change that piece of data. Or we can use log-oriented tables, which I have a blog post about, which uh, can help as well. You just mark deletes in the table, uh, and then you treat the table as a log. There are column stores that don't have write penalties. Uh, hybrid column stores uh, are our example, and memory-based column stores also don't have that penalty. So in-memory analytics is popular and gaining popularity, and almost all in-memory analytics systems are columnar. You may need to have a lot of RAM, right? more RAM than your actual data set in some cases, and you may have to have a lot of swap. Basically, you have to have uh, enough physical address or virtual addressable memory uh, in order to uh, create an index. Right? So if you want to load uh, a one terabyte uh, table and uh, it's got a 700 gig index, then you're going to need 700 gigs of addressable virtual memory. Row stores typically give you indexes. Right? They allow you to create B-tree indexes, which are leveraged for constraints and binary search. Right? So this is great for lookups and for uh, maintaining data integrity as long as the data fits in memory. But as soon as system no longer fits in memory, the performance characteristics are significantly different, and uh, oftentimes caching has to be employed in order to get good performance. So the reason being that these are tree indexes, and you typically have to do reads to satisfy writes. And InnoDB has the uh, change buffer to reduce this, and TokuDB has fractal indexes to reduce this, but it still is a repro uh, nevertheless, you have to do I.O. eventually, right? Row store, you can use partitioning to decrease the index size, right? But database still has single-threaded queries, right? And you still have to read an entire row for uh, each column read from each partition, right? You can't read it. the OLAP queries. Column stores oftentimes support bitmap indexes. And some row stores, Oracle, for example, does also support bitmap indexes. Uh, but columnar storage itself lends very well to uh, bitmaps because the, the column data is very similar to an array. So the bitmap indexes are good for Boolean searches over multiple columns, right, because the bitmaps can be compared very efficiently. But they're not supported by MySQL, and they are expensive to update. So there is FastBit. Right? FastBit is an academic 
column store. It has a simple text interface that it comes with. It's basically just a few example programs for using the library that really is the meat of FastBit. The interesting thing about FastBit is that it has what are called word-aligned hybrid compressed bitmaps. Right? These particular bitmaps can be compared while still compressed. So uh, you have very, very uh, dense bitmaps that can be compared efficiently. And unlike traditional bitmaps that uh, only work with low cardinality values, FastBit also works with high cardinality uh, values and can be as efficient as B-tree lookups. So you can use it for external indexing of your MySQL tables. That's a, an excellent way to use it, similar to how you would use Sphinx. Or you could actually build a storage engine out of it uh, if you wanted to. The utilities that it comes with are limited. Uh, it does not really speak uh, SQL. It speaks a kind of uh, no SQL-ish SQL. Basically, select and where are supported and grouped by. Only two table joins, as I said, and it's append only, so you can mark data as deleted. But it does not do any compression. So as I said, it's great for external indexing of MySQL, and you could integrate it directly into the database. LucidDB. LucidDB is a Java-based columnar database. So you have to install Java, and then you can install LucidDB. One of the very nice things about LucidDB is that it has full-featured uh, SQL 2003 SQL Med data wrappers. So it is very easy to attach external data and do ETL or ELT rather uh, inside of LucidDB. It also has built-in data versioning. So this is great for data warehouses when you want to be able to update what are called dimension tables or lookup tables. Right? Uh, in a traditional data warehouse, you need to uh, have a very complex process to update those tables and keep old versions of the rows available so that you can get a historical view of what the data of the warehouse looked like at any point in time. With built-in data versioning, that happens automatically. You can simply update uh, the various tables, and then you can run a query and look at the database as of any particular point in time. So very, very useful uh, feature. Uh, it was commercially backed until last year, but uh, then the commercial backing ended. So it's now uh, an Apache licensed uh, project, and I'm sure that uh, it could I uh, would appreciate some open source community love. It has bitmap indexes and also tree-based indexes. So it has foreign keys, primary keys, unique key constraints. It has ANSI SQL support, uh, multiple join algorithms, uh, but its queries are single-threaded. And there was an experimental scale-out system that they were working on called Firewater, uh, but that is still uh, not really ready. So it's a feature-rich column store with advanced versioning. So if you need uh, advanced versioning, if that is something that uh, you need for reporting purposes or for compliance purposes, uh, this can be really great for you. So historical reporting. It doesn't have low latency requirements. Uh, the uh, LucidDB is not the fastest of the column stores, as we will see in the uh, performance comparisons. And they acknowledged this uh, openly. That it wasn't their goal to be the fastest column store. They wanted to be feature rich. And so if you need all of these features, uh, these other column stores might not have them uh, because the other column stores decided to trade features for performance. So it can definitely be an excellent choice when the data set doesn't fit in memory and you have to do reporting. Uh, 
but and then particularly if constraints on the data, like foreign keys are still required. And it's designed for OLAP, not for OLTB. MonoDB has been around for a while now, almost 10 years. It is open source. Once again, I would consider it an academic project. It's designed for in-memory databases, right? The entire database can be larger than memory, but the indexes have to fit in addressable RAM. So like I said, if you have a 700 gig index, you may need 700 gigs of RAM, or at least 700 gigs of available swap. It can compress data on disk, but in memory, data is not represented compressed. In memory, it's basically an array, right? But it does have parallel query execution, and it can take advantage of vectorized operations on the CPU and multiple join algorithms. So it has hash joins, nested loop joins, and sort merge joins. Also supports, you know, all the typical constraints that you're familiar with. So MonoDB is a, a choice if you need a high performance uh, in-memory uh, column store. Uh, but there are some problems with it. I did get wrong results on one of the complex queries. So I would test your queries uh, thoroughly. So it's definitely good for low latency OLAP. Right? If you need extremely fast results, MonoDB is probably uh, something you want to look at because all the data uh, does uh, get copied into memory and all operations happen uh, in memory. And it also supports frequent updates. Right? If it is in memory, updates are not a problem. InfoBright Community Edition. So InfoBright is a MySQL column store. So unlike other storage engines uh, which use the MySQL optimizer for execution, InfoBright has its own uh, InfoBright execution engine or InfoBright optimizer that queries uh, go through. And it also has its own loader that runs in the background called bhloader but it still does support the load data in file syntax. It stores data inside of what it calls data packs, and data packs are 64 KB in length, and it has a knowledge grid. The knowledge grid stores information about the data packs, like each column's min and max, etc. So when you're doing a query, it can use set theory to determine whether or not it needs to decompress certain packets. And if it has to decompress the packets, it will go and uh, decompress them. Now, it is, I believe, what they call loose set theory. So it can make a wrong choice. And in some cases, it will go and decompress data that does not need to be decompressed. But it never makes the other wrong choice. Sometimes it, it won't ever miss data, right? So your queries are always right. Though it does have an approximate query function, which can, is actually really cool, and I don't think I've ever seen in any other sort of database uh, where you can ask for approximate results and get things back much faster uh, than uh, the exact uh, results. One interesting thing about InfoBright is that some queries can examine only the knowledge grid. You can think of the knowledge grid as kind of a somewhat pre-aggregated set of statistics, and some queries can access only those stats. And internally, it does hash joins. But it does not support indexes at all. So no indexes, no primary keys, no constraints, no auto increment nothing that requires any sort of index. No triggers. Basically, it's a flat table. The loader in ICE is single-threaded, and you can only access a single table for writing at once, but you can write multiple tables at the same time. 
and queries are single threaded, right? But I have a tool called shard query, which we'll talk about a little bit later. It can use be used with ICE to make it MPP, multi-node. Doesn't support temp tables, rename table, or DDL, right? So fairly limited in what you can do. Basically, just load data. So it's great for loading machine-oriented data. It also has some data type limitations, like no unsigned data types and uh, decimal 18.2 being the largest decimal available. Also because there's no constraints, you cannot declare columns as not null, right? There's also InfoBright Enterprise. Enterprise has a much, much feature SQL set support, right? So you can insert, update, delete, rename and truncate tables. You can add and drop columns and uh, can't rename columns though, but you can rename tables. And it supports temporary tables. It also has a parallel loader uh, which is uh, through their distributed loader, right? The, uh, if you use load data in file, it's still single writer per table. And you can uh, load binary data direct. It's basically kind of a, a fixed width format that loads much faster than having to parse flat files. It also has parallel query, but once again, it's single node, right? So uh, it can scale up as you add uh, additional cores. Doesn't support indexes or constraints just like ICE has the same data type limitations as ICE, and as I said, unless you're using the distributed load processor, it's a single thread per table loading. Other queries can still read from the table in both ICE and IEEE. It's still only one query can load a table at a particular time. But given that the database is intended to be batch loaded, it's not really much of a limitation. Once again, IEEE does not inherently support MPP scale out. Doesn't have multi-node capabilities, but shard query can be used with it. InfiniDB is the other MySQL uh, based column store. It has data type limitations that are similar to InfoBright. It is parallel query. However, you are required to bind it to only a single CPU, and that CPU may have at most four cores. And it doesn't support multi-node. It also does not have any indexes and no uh, knowledge grid. So it relies more on uh, crunching data faster through parallelism than it does uh, using a smart lookup has distributed hash joins uh, through those parallel processes, and it does not compress data. Uh, load data in file does not work properly, at least for me, so you have to really use their external CP import tool. And uh, the community license is very restrictive. As I said, you have to bind it to a single core and the license requires that you report usage to Calpont upon their requests. So I did not bother to actually test uh, InfiniDB for these reasons. So I've mentioned uh, MPP a few times. So massively parallel processing databases are able to use uh, more than a single thread to answer a query and more than a single node, right? So MPP products support distributing the data over more than one server, and then running the query, obviously, over more than one server, right? Distributed queries. MPP products tend to claim linear scalability. That is, of course, the goal of these products. 
So if you add another server, if you double the resources, then the system should be able to double the throughput or do twice the work. Right? So efficiency should increase linearly with resources or should stay the same. InfinityDB Enterprise, which you can buy their enterprise license, the company is called Calpunt. Uh, it uh, does parallel query with MPP scale out, so it can automatically spread data over multiple nodes. It has a parallel loader. It includes map reduce capability as well, and it compresses data. Right, so you'll end up with a smaller footprint and get better performance because uh, less data has to be read from disk. In other respects, it's pretty much similar to the community edition. HP Vertica. So Vertica is a highly available hybrid row and columnar database. So it has aspects of both row and column stores. That's because it has both what they call ROS and WAS, read optimized storage and write optimized storage. So objects are copied out of the column store, which is read optimized storage, into the write optimized storage for updates, and bulk loads can be done directly into the read optimized store uh, if necessary. And then of course trickle or frequent inserts can be done directly and those go through the write optimized storage and then are merged over time into read optimized storage. That's uh, was rush flushing they call. So it's based on C store. So if you want to try out the open source version of this or the uh, historical precursor to this, you can check out C store. It was created by M uh, Michael Stonebreaker, right? Michael Stonebreaker uh, this guy originally created uh, PostgreSQL. He's also associated with VoltDB. Vertica distributes data across systems on a per table basis. So you can choose uh, different tables to be distributed differently. You can even have a you know a 20 node cluster and have some tables that are distributed on all 20 nodes and other tables that are distributed only on you know, five nodes. Right? It, it, it's up to you. The distribution is called segmentation. So you, you pick a, a segmentation key and that's, or keys, and that's how the, the table is split up. If you do not segment a table, that table is duplicated on all of the nodes. Right? So it's replicated to all of the nodes. This makes uh, joins between segmented and unsegmented tables very, very fast. So it's good for star schemas because your lookup tables, your dimension tables are copied to all of the nodes so you get fast joins to your dimension tables. It also supports partitioning that gets additional node level parallelism and partition elimination. And it's kind of cool, it has automatic partitioning so you can Every time, if you say partition by week, when a new uh, value for week shows up, a new partition for that value will simply be created. You don't have to manually create partitions. You can remove and add nodes online in Vertica. It uses consistent hashing for this, so it stores data on more than one node. But interestingly, constraints are parsed during query execution, not during loading. So constraints are extremely deferred. You can get an FK error or a primary key error or whatever during a select, right? Because the, the database will find the data discrepancy when reading rather than when writing. And then you'll have to fix the discrepancy before you can properly query the data. The spread toolkit is used uh, underneath the covers 
for communication in Vertica. So uh, it has basically a 256 node uh, max. Amazon Redshift is a hosted database in uh, Amazon. So this uses uh, a PostgreSQL protocol. Uh, Redshift is based on Par Excel. There's a partnership between Amazon and Par Excel. Amazon made a almost $30 million investment in Par Excel uh, to get this technology. So you can talk to it using uh, the PostgreSQL client uh, or PostgreSQL, ODPC, JDBC clients. Uh, one of the neat things about Redshift is that it can bulk load from S3 or DynamoDB. So if you've got data in Dynamo or you put data into S3, maybe you uh, want to uh, query the log files of all of your web servers. You can have the web servers automatically push their data into S3 and then load that data into Redshift and query it very efficiently. Multi-node parallel query has very good compression and uh, it has automatic sharding. Right? If you do not shard a table manually, if you don't pick a disk key column similar to the segmentation key column in Vertica, then it will create its own uh, hidden uh, column to distribute the data on. Right? So you also can choose to sort tables in Redshift because it doesn't have indexes. Once again, there's no indexes or constraints. Uh, so you need to sort uh, your data to get good performance. For example, if you have a uh, orders table and you typically access orders by date, uh, if you sort it by date, then it'll be able to do a binary sort on the table by date. And that's effectively the one index that you get. It also has a really neat optimization. If you have uh, two tables that are that have the same sort keys and distribution keys and you join them together, uh, a sort merge join will be used and the sort phase can be omitted, right? Because both tables are sorted on the same keys. So the sort phase is omitted and the merge happens. So it's very, very fast. However, joins between tables that are distributed on different columns can be expensive. And this is the same in Vertica as it is in Redshift. If you join two different tables that are distributed on different columns, data is going to have to move between nodes. Right? So the idea here is that you want to keep all of the tables that you want to join together on the same node for good performance. So if you have a blog table, for example, and uh, blog posts and blog comments, you want to have the disk key be blog ID in all of those tables. That way, all of the rows for one particular blog ID are all on the same node. Redshift has a maximum node limitation of 16 nodes. So it parses constraints like primary key, but it does not enforce them. And it might make query plans based on assumptions about foreign keys and primary keys, particularly uh, subqueries. Right? So you can get wrong results if you uh, define constraints, but then violate them. So you have to be very careful about the data that you load. And uh, changing the size of your cluster, if you want to go from eight nodes to 10 nodes, requires copying all of the data out of the eight node system into a new 10 node system. It apparently uses a hashing distribution method and does not support changing the number of nodes. So you can still read from the cluster while this process happens, but it is read only during the resize. So you can imagine if you've got a 300 terabyte database cluster, that could take quite a while to resize. It's not something that you're going to be wanting to do on a regular basis. Resizing in Vertica isn't that terrible because it has consistent hashing and data is already stored on more than one node 
in the system. So while the resize is happening, it can still always find the data uh, on the old place uh, while, while it gets moved around. Hadoop is a complicated topic. It's really kind of an entire ecosystem. Just know that traditional MapReduce is not well suited for regular database queries. Right? To get good performance, data that is joined together really has to be on the same node. It can't be copied from disk over the network into memory and then joined together. That's just too expensive. So you need to have data on the same node to get good performance. So there's two main new SQL, I would call them products that are available for Hadoop. They bring SQL-like languages to Hadoop. There's Hive and Cloudera Impala. And Hive has been around longer, but it is slower. It has very high latency. Query times, even for small amounts of data, can be 30 seconds or a minute. Right? The cost of spinning up Hadoop jobs is high. And if you need to join data, Hive is probably not the solution uh, for you. Joins are very expensive. But if you have large flat tables that you need to uh, scan uh, in parallel, and the latency cost isn't a big deal because you've got lots and lots of data, you know, terabytes and terabytes and terabytes of data, uh, then Hive might be uh, a good choice. Impala is really quite cool. It adds an SQL layer and the column store to Hadoop. So Hadoop is used for scheduling uh, the jobs against the uh, column store. It supports partitioning data, right? And data that is partitioned ends up on the same node, right? So going back to the blog example, we partitioned all the tables by blog ID. All the tables with the, uh, all the rows with the same blog ID will end up on the same node. So joins between those tables will be fast. Impala supports existing Hadoop data. Uh, sequence files, for example, but it also supports Parquet, which is the new compressed uh, column store format uh, that it introduced. And Car uh, Parquet is uh, quite interesting. It's a very cool format. It's based on uh, uh, Google's new Dremel tool. Uh, reading Impala's website, they say that they, in their typical examples, see 7 to 45x improvement in single uh, query, uh, single join queries, right? So it's quite an improvement. And for queries without joins, uh, they still claim that it has a 4x improvement over Hive. But you can't get large results out of it. Queries have to have an order by and limit 1,000. No UDF support at this time. Instance joins sometimes must be done on disk. Their maximum join size is limited by the smallest node. And of course, no constraints, indexes, yeah, etc. And finally, uh, shard query, which isn't a database by itself, but really is a middleware tool that uh, lets you talk to multiple databases and treats those multiple databases as one big virtual database. Right? So it creates a virtual schema over physical schema. You pick one column as the shard key. Once again, going back to the blog example, this would be blog ID. So the blog table, blog comments, blog posts, those would be sharded tables. And the, those tables would be distributed around the cluster. Tables that do not have that shard key will be duplicated on all nodes. Right? So this is similar, once again, to Vertica. This makes joins between sharded and unsharded tables very fast. 
Now, unlike Redshift, Shard Query doesn't support joins between tables that are sharded by different keys because there can only be one shard key in the virtual schema. So it's impossible to even have tables that are sharded by different keys. In addition, if you're using a storage engine that supports partitioning, you can partition your tables to get additional parallelism on each node. Right? So if you have 12 core systems, you could partition by or shard by year. So you have three years of data. So you have three machines, each have 12 cores. You can partition by month right? and then subpartition by day. If you access uh, a week's worth of data, you'll get parallelism over uh, seven subpartitions. If you do, if you access you know, 12 months, you'll get at parallelism over all 12 partitions for each month, in addition to the parallelism over the three nodes. Right? So essentially, there would be uh, 36 queries running simultaneously, uh, fetching data and processing it. It supports all of the MySQL storage engines, so ExtraDB, TokuDB, InnoDB, and InfoBright. So you can use it with both column stores and row stores. So it supports Oracle, MySQL, Percona Server, and MariaDB. I haven't tested it with Drizzle. I suspect that Drizzle probably doesn't work because it probably lacks an information schema dot partitions table. It's limited by whatever storage engine you use, right? So if you're using InfoBright, you're not going to have indexes or constraints. Some functions, a small subset, aren't supported, like last insert ID and get lock and release lock. Uh, it's not transactional, right? So if you make updates, uh, they'll, the, the individual update is atomic, but you can't group multiple uh, statements together. And it doesn't have temporary tables, but you can create unique real tables with create table as select. And then just real quick, because we're just about out of time, a look at performance. I used the star schema benchmark. As you can see, uh, the fact table is line order, and we've got these short other lookup tables called dimension tables. So part, customer, date, and supplier are the dimension tables. Loading. Uh, MonetDB won overall in loading, but it was very, very close with ICE. Uh, LucidDB and InnoDB uh, both had about the same amount of time at loading as well. Now, keep in mind that LucidDB has a uh, B-tree primary key, which accounts for most of this time. Point uh, lookup query. Uh, Worked really well for MonetDB. Uh, still also very, very fast for ICE. LucidDB, not as fast. But InnoDB here is the uh, clear winner. And it should be at the top, but unfortunately I didn't put it at the top. However, looking at an aggregate query, here we can immediately see the benefit of the column store. So we've got uh, ICE uh, winning at two hundredths of, or sorry, two thousandths of a second, ten, two hundredths and then one thousandth of a second. Sorry, having a hard time reading. MonetDB was second, LucidDB came in third, and InnoDB once again uh, was pretty uh, fast here. Complex query, however, uh, not so uh, good for InnoDB at all. You can see InnoDB down there. Uh, way, way worse for the complex query. ICE, most certainly the winner here, followed by MonetDB and then LucidDB. But still, LucidDB is significantly faster than InnoDB but I clearly the standout winner.
And then this is the star schema benchmark query 2.1. This is the query I used for my most complex query. And once again, ICE is the winner here. I will note that MonetDB did execute the query faster, but the result was wrong. And you know, fast wrong results are still wrong results. So unfortunately, don't have, I didn't record the time because of that. But ICE, you can see, definitely has a huge advantage here over uh, InnoDB, the row store. And then finally, uh, this the those were scale factor five, right? So uh, 30 million rows in the table. I tried shard query uh, with Infobright community versus uh, Redshift, uh, which is once again the Amazon offering. Uh, but this time, uh, it's scale factor 200, uh, which is 1.2 billion rows and spread the data over 16 nodes. And interestingly, the, the, the cost of the Redshift nodes in this case is actually three times the cost of the Shard Query nodes. So Shard Query is uh, competing extremely well versus Redshift in uh, this particular benchmark. And there's a full link to it down there. And like I said, I will include links to all of these different uh, column stores in the uh, blog post with the Q&A follow-up to any questions that you have. And that concludes the webinar in just about the right perfect time. Thank you very much, Justin. Well, guys and, and ladies, uh, we're out of time. So what I'm going to do is just leave the questions window open for a few minutes. Um, so people go ahead and answer, uh, type in as many questions as you would like. Um, I'll shut this down in about five minutes or so. Um, and then, as I said before, Justin will address any of these questions in his follow-up blog post. Thank you so much for attending today's webinar. Next week, we have Peter Zaitsev, who is our founder and CEO, presenting um, MySQL 5.6 configuration optimization, so I encourage you to sign up for that. Um, so go ahead and uh, type in as many questions as you would like, and I'll get those over to Justin. Thank you so much for your time today, Justin, and everybody have a wonderful evening or morning or afternoon, depending on where you are. Thank you. Thank you. Good day.